Jesus name we pray. Tonight I want you to just welcome somebody to your right and to your left and we are beginning a new teaching, new series and I want you to give me your undivided attention. Hallelujah. So we'll be teaching on casting all your cares. All your cares. First Peter chapter 5 we are reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 5 we are reading from verse 6. We'll be dealing with this for some days. He said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Next, verse 7. Casting all your care. It didn't say cares. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Humility makes you submit without holding a care. And that's why Peter began by saying, humble yourself. The act of allowing God is a demonstration of humility. I started and I want you to be writing. The act of trusting God. That act of trusting God is a demonstration of humility. It's time you hold to cares, you are not submitting to God. So each time I submit, I show that I trust in his ability. How do you cast your cares? We cast our cares via words. Because the content of a man is revealed by his utterance. A man is known by what he says. So the Bible didn't say, pray about your care. The Bible said, cast your care. You didn't hear what I just said. The Bible didn't say, pray about your care. Care, the Bible says, cast them. Now, again, you are not supposed to massage your care. You know, like people, there are people who like to massage. Can you imagine what I'm going through now? You think by telling everybody what you are going through is a way of handling the matter. But understand, when you do that, you massage it. And everything you massage, you strengthen. A lot of people have strengthened their care unknown to them by their words. Can I hear an amen from somebody? Now, if worry is on say, don't buy. Because the other word for care is worry. It's anxiety. If it's on say, don't buy. A lot of people are selling it, and every day is on say, on say. But quite a number of people, they are buying it, and we'll find out how they have been buying cares. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, we'll read from verse 30 to 31. Jesus had told them a few things about their cares. If you don't mind, we, might, we may start from 25. That will give you a background to what Jesus was saying. From verse 25, please. I could have just gone through 30. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Quickly, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field. Question, who clothed the grass of the field? And that God is your father. Which today is? Things that are of no value, God care. How much more you who is of great value? Your value is seen in the work of redemption. If Christ could die for you, that shows your value in the scheme and in the program of God. Now, if the grass of the field that today is and tomorrow is nothing, because we will put them in the scale of preference. Man has more value than all of those things. He said, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Now little faith is talking about thoughts that 
you give yourself to that in you worry. So little faith is demonstrated or is being explained here as thoughts, cares, anxiety, worry. Verse 31. Therefore, take no thought. Saying, how do you take thought? How do you take thought? Say. How do you take thought? Saying, take no thought. Saying, what shall we eat? Are they legitimate? Yes. What to eat? Is it legitimate? Yes. But God said, take no thought. Don't start saying, how will I eat? Where will it come from? How, who will I meet? As much as it is legitimate, the Bible says, take no thought. The reason is, provision has been made. Never you think that when you get into need, God will call the angels. Oh, what are we going to do? Provision has been made before the need arises. Am I communicating? Therefore, take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or where without shall we be clothed? So people take thought and how they take thought is in what they say. Now, worry is a practice of unbelief. Worry is a practice of unbelief because you doubt the ability of your father. So, each time you worry, each time you walk in anxiety, each time you take thought, you demonstrate unbelief towards God. Now, I give you a typical example of a man in the Bible, Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. Job chapter 3. I read 25 and 26. Please, let's make progress. Job 25. I read 26 and 27. Job said, the thing for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. Take note. Job said, what I'm experiencing is my fear. What I'm experiencing is my anxiety. What I'm experiencing is my worry. So what that means is that fear is an invitation. Write that down. It will help you. It will help you. Your mind may forget. But what you write down, you can go back. Fear is an invitation. If you please, it's a proposal. Waiting for you to either reject or accept. It's a proposal. So for the man Job, his fear became his experience. I was not in safety. This is what fear does. This is what anxiety does. This is what worry does. I was not in safety. Neither had I rest. Neither was I quiet. Yet trouble came. The trouble of Job was predicated on the fact that the fear he had brought those things. So we can say that Job was highly developed in fear. Write this down. I will never be developed in fear. You know, the way you develop yourself, maybe in your career or in your vocation, do not develop in fear. Job was highly developed in fear. And his fear became his experience. Nobody should ever fan fear. Fear must be dealt with. He was not quiet. He was speaking. Like I said, your words, they betray you. Your words will be the way you take thought. He said, I was not quiet. Hey, how will I get this? Uh, who will help me? How, how will it ever happen? That is not our calling. But can we do something? Job chapter 1, verse 1. Look at the estimation of God over Job. How did God rate Job? It's important we know this. This is the Job who said, mm -mm, I'm me fear. But what was the estimation? What was the view of God but Job, please follow me. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. In the sight of God, he was seen differently. But in his own eyes, he saw himself differently. You didn't hear me. Right where you are, you are important to God. God values you. 
God has placed everything he owns upon your life. He has saved you with the blood of his son. And stop looking at yourself differently. Look, the introduction of Job is that he was a man that feared God. He was a righteous man. But Job saw himself differently. He said, no, even with all this thing I'm doing, something might happen, no. Did you hear what I said? Even after this, my prayer, something might happen, no. You can't, you, nobody knows tomorrow. Am I communicating? But that's not all. If you take verse 5 and 6, you will now see how Job's problem began. How that Job viewed himself wrongly. However, God never viewed him wrongly. Help me tap your neighbor. Say, God doesn't view you wrongly. Then don't view yourself wrongly. Now, this is where fear comes. When you see how God views you, it should strengthen who you are. Instead of viewing yourself away from how God views you. Verse 5. And it was so. When the day of their feasting were gone about, about sorry, gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offering according to the number of them for uh, them all. For Job said, it may be that my son have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus did Job how? His fear was always that sin. My children may have fallen into sin. But was it the view of God about him? No. You see, fear does not just come. Anxiety does not just come. The lack of understanding of who you are in Christ is what the devil takes advantage of to prey on you. Help me tap your neighbor. Say you must see correctly. I didn't hear you well. Say you must see correctly. God sees you differently. All that Job needed was to accept the revelation of God. And in the same vein, you need to accept the revelation of God about you. What did I say? And who are you? Blessed? Come on. Blessed? Are you blessed? Come on. Are you blessed? And a blessed man shouldn't be afraid of anything. Are you righteous? The righteous is always bold. Am I speaking to somebody? This was the ch problem of Job. Verse 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came. Now, what invited him was the fear that Job had. And we have to cast all those things. He didn't say we pray them, you cast them, and you cast them based on something. Now the question I want to say, making sacrifice on behalf of his children shows a rejection of God's view of him. Because God's view of him was not predicated on sacrifice to sanctify them. You know why I'm doing this? My children will be married though. Let me, do you induce God because your children will be married? <coughs> your children will be married because it's a natural cause. You didn't hear what I just said. You don't start inducing. You don't start living in fear. And for any reason, it, there is a delay. He said, Lord, I did this so your sacrifice is not necessary. Look at your neighbor say, your sacrifice is not necessary. So casting your care will begin with a revelation of how God sees you. What did I say? And again, you must understand that he cares for you. Let's go back to that, our text. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. We are back there again. Let's play around that. First Peter chapter 5. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Next verse. How? Talk to me. Casting all your care upon him. For what purpose? Does he care for you? So write down these few things I'm about to say. Casting of care is a knowledge thing. And what would be that knowledge? Number one, that he cares for you. I repeat that again. Casting of care is a knowledge thing. That knowledge will be number one. He cares for you. Number two, I know that he cares. You know, one can care without you knowing that he cares. So number two is that I know he cares. Not just that he cares. I know that he cares. Now number three is that I know he cares for me. You personalize it. You personalize it. It's no longer general. He cares. 
it's no longer I know that he cares but I know he cares for me and number four I cast my care <laughs> now the reason I am confident that he cares for me is that God has done the impossible therefore I can cast my care upon him what was the impossible he that knew no sin became sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus that was impossible because man had sinned but he took my place and not only did he take my place he was raised by God so the restoration is my confidence that he cares write that down to help you the restoration is my confidence that he cares if he could answer the question of sin in my life now my worries are already taken care of his sacrifice has handled the main thing so whatever is a challenge today is small you know we quote this scripture very often in, in Romans chapter 8 verse 32 that he that spent not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely I love the freely I said I love the freely he cares if he could do the bigger one these ones are so small so the story of redemption is a proof of my importance in the scheme and in the program of God. Would you say this with me? He cares for me. He cares for me. I know he cares for me. Then I can cast my care. Who is the first to say amen? amen. Pastor, you don't understand. God factored everything you say I don't understand into this. That I said cast it because he cares. Pastor may not understand. But God factored everything. He said, casting all your care upon him. For he cared for you. Verse 8. I didn't do verse 8. Verse 8 says, be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a rolling lion walketh about. Seeking whom he may devour. Question. Does he devour everybody? He will seek out those who are vulnerable. He will seek out those who want to handle their care by themselves. He seeks out those who cannot trust God. And then he devours them. Now to be sober will mean to be in the right mind. Not to be drunk. You didn't hear what I just said. A believer that worries is drunk. Because by right, you should be in the right mind. Don't let situation what how you reason anxiety is drunkenness in the spiritual opposite what did i say anxiety is drunkenness in the spiritual opposite so you must always be in your right sense of mind it is called soberness what did i call it soberness. it is called what soberness so the devil is a state of that mind that will take you away from your confidence in christ now look at what do I do to maintain my sanctity? Verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. To maintain my sanctity. He said, whom resist? Come on. What did he say? Whom resist? How do you resist? Steadfast in the faith. You cannot win the battle of life outside of the faith. What did I say? You cannot win the battle of life outside of the faith. So you resisted first in the faith. The reason he said so is said, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He said, Pastor, I can't, I can't handle this. There are brothers that have handled this somewhere. There are people who have gone through the same thing. And don't magnify it. What did I say? Don't magnify. Something must stand strong in your heart. And God is so committed to you. That David will have to chant it. Even under the Old Testament. If you read with me. In, in Psalm 23. People quote it. Psalm 23. People quote it very often. But I want us to look at it. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Let's read. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Say that to yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Say it like a minute. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. Say it until your heart is settled on that. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So the shepherd is the shepherd's responsibility to take the sheep to where the sheep finds pasture. Not the other way around. Unfortunately, we want to lead the shepherd. You didn't hear what I said. I said, unfortunately, we want to lead the shepherd. You see, we can actually cast our care. And we'll be on this for a long time. Casting all your care upon him because he cares. If you trust the shepherd, you can cast. It is a pray. It's a cast. It means tonight, I can say, Lord, this has been heavy on me. I drop it. What did I say? I drop it. I cast it because you care. Not just that you care. I think we will do it with the amplified rendering. That he does it affectionately. This is how you can see the emotions of God there. First Peter chapter 5 verse 7. We we'll use the amplified rendering. And then it conveys the emotions. It's a casting the whole of your care. All your anxiety. All your worries. All your concerns. You know why this woman had to use this other word, synonyms, if you please? It's because some people say, no, I'm just concerned. He's telling you concern is part of it. You didn't hear what I just Oh, Pastor Bad, I'm just concerned. No, it is part of what we are dealing with. It's anxiety. It is worry. Once and for all on him. For he cares for you. How? Affectionately and cares about you how watchfully those two words I've been looking for he does it affectionately and he does it watchfully so I can trust him you didn't hear what I said I can trust him I can always count on him I can always depend on him he is my shepherd I can cast because he made a promise that he cares and he demonstrated his care by going to the cross for me. And he was raised from the dead. So the restoration is my proof that he cares. How that God commended his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners. He died for us. Am I communicating? How did God prove it? When we were sinners. He died for us. Now that we have known him. We can absolutely trust him. Because he said he affectionately. And watchfully cares. Somebody say amen. amen. Give me a message rendering of this. Give me a message rendering of it. Please sit. Give me a message rendering. Look at it. Live carefree before God. I'm the one preaching. Look at me. Live carefree before God. He is most careful. Amen. Hallelujah. Who is most careful with you? Not your brother, not your husband, not your wife, not your children. There is one who is most. That would be the zenith of care. You didn't hear me. It's the peak of care. Oh, you care about your spouse. No problem. But there is a zenith to care. What he offers. See, do not allow worry drown you. Cast that worry. Cast that care. Cast that concern. Don't let it drown you. It is a plot of the devil. What did I say? It's a plot of the devil. Because the devil is seeking opportunity to put people in the danger of fear. Now, you see, the way we deal with fear is to trust the faithfulness of God. Let's look at Job again. In Job chapter 3 verse 25, 26, I want to refresh your mind so we can come to James and see how Job was described in James. A lot of time, why people can't cast their care, Job's life will reveal that to you. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. And that which I was afraid of is come unto me. I was not in safety. But the Bible never said so. Even the devil said, you have built 
and hedge round about him. But you see, his estimation of himself was far from how God saw him. He said, neither had I rest. Neither was I quiet. Was just talking. Yet trouble came. But how would James talk about Job? James would speak to us about Job in James chapter 5, verse 11. Let's see how James interpreted the life of Job. James chapter 5. Read from verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endured. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is what? Very pitiful and of what? Tenderness. Now hold it there. We'll use a different rendering. Something stood out there. We saw what Job went through. Job's fear brought those things upon him. But in the midst of what Job went through, James points out the faithfulness of God. He said, you know how we call those blessed, happy, who were steadfast, who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the lost purpose and how he richly blessed him. In the end, in so much as the Lord is full of what? Pity, that is compassion and tenderness and mercy. NLT. I need a modern English. And you know what Pastor Barry did without talking about p- p- compassion and pity in the parable of the wicked servant and the king. How I many of you remember? And you know, some, so many questions were raised. He said, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him. At the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness. Now, why are we reading this? To let you know who your father is. That in the light of that, you can always cast your care. Even if you have missed it, you can come back to the one who still knows how to redirect your steps and put you on course. Who is the first to say amen? In the midst of what Job went through, something stood out. Job wavered. And that was the greatest problem of Job. James will give us a lead to that in James chapter 1 verse 5 to 8. We studied that in this church, but we'll quickly go through that. It will give us a lead to the life of Job. We have 15 minutes and we'll be out of this place. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all. How? Liberally. And upbraid it not. And it shall so God is constant. If I were you, I write that down. God is constant. He's constant. We we know the side to find God. We can know where God is at every given point in time. God will not say no. God will not upbraid. But look at the challenge with man. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavered is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and thoughts. For let not that man think that he can, he shall receive anything of the Lord. Question, is God constant? Does God operate? No, but why will man not receive? When man waver, that man will put a blockage on his receiving. Not because he's not be given. Did you hear what I just said? Help me tap your neighbor. A double-minded man is unstable in all his way. So this will be the challenge of Job. At one time, he was a man that fears God. He was righteous. He eschewed evil. The other time, he was a paraventure. My children have done this. Let me make sacrifice. Let me do this. Question, was God ever interested in sacrifice? Like you remember, Samuel, will say to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hack him than the fat of rams. God has never demanded sacrifice from man. Alright, that's not where we're going to stop. We're going to read verse 2 to 4 of James chapter 1 to give us an idea 
of what Joe, uh, James was dealing with when he explained this. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work at what? Patience. But let patience have a perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Let me tap your neighbor and say, allow your patience. Allow your patience. Stop jittering. Stop, Stop the agitation. Stop, Stop the trouble. He cares for you. Yes. Who is the first to say amen? amen? So patience keeps a man in faith. That's why I'm talking about this. Faith, patience keeps a man in faith. And so, the Bible, will, I'll quote this. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews 6.10, it said, put it up, put it up. Hebrews 6.10. It's not part of my note. Hebrews 6.10. Hebrews. Am I too fast tonight? No. Okay. Hebrews 6.10. Verse 10. Okay. Verse 12. Verse 12. All right, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through what faith. and what and what did they do? So faith without patience is fake. Write it down. It will bring you into this service when you remember it or when you read it. Faith without patience is fake. Fake faith lacks patience. A real faith carries patience. And but God said it will happen. You need patience. <laughs> we must be followers of those who through faith and patience. Why is this necessary? So you don't get into anxiety. So you don't get into worries. So you don't get into cares. So you don't get into concerns. He that will come will come and will not tarry. But the just shall live by his faith. Glory be to God forever. I say glory be to God forever. Why must we not allow fear? First John chapter 4. Verse 17. As I begin to round up for tonight. First John chapter 4 from verse 17. We'll round up for tonight. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Next verse. There is no fear. But perfect love. The love of the Father over your life should keep fear where it belongs. That's a perfect. What did he say? Because fear has torment. Does fear have torment? Does fear carry torment? Yes, there is no fear in love. I'm sold out to him. I thought you said that. I'm sold out to him. I said I'm, I'm sold out to him. So there's no fear in me. Perfect fear cast out. F perfect love cast out fear. And he explained it. Because fear has torment. The torment of fear has killed men. More than the things they were afraid of. I say that again. The torment of fear has killed men more than what they were afraid of. Fear has a lot of torment. Like a man of God once said. He said fear is like a man sitting on a rocker chair. You would think you are moving but you are still in one place. And that is the danger of fear. It paralyzes you of your natural tendency. What did I say? Fear paralyzes you of your natural tendency. I'll give you a typical example because on Sunday we'll take it off from there. The man called Peter saw Jesus walk on the water. And he said, if it be you, bid me come. Jesus said, come to me. And Peter stepped out of the boat, walked on the water. And the Bible said, when the wind was but serious and he saw the effect of the wind, it was beginning to sink. Naturally, as a fisherman, swimming is part of their part of their expertise or skills. If I were him, if I'm sinking, I swim. But you see, when fear comes in, you forget what you can do. You didn't hear what I said. 
Have you noticed a man who sees a rattlesnake? He tries to run, he falls. He tries to run, he falls. Why? Not because his legs couldn't carry him. Fear paralyzes him of his ability to, to run. You didn't hear what I just said. Well, have you seen a man? Maybe they prank that man. And he's to run. He falls. He stands up. He falls. And you're wondering, what has happened? It's fear. It paralyzes you of your natural tendency. But in the midst of that, we have perfect love. The love of God that is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says there is no fear in love. The one you love, you don't fear. The one you love, you don't anticipate, oh, what if this thing does not work? The one you love, you cast yourself, you throw yourself into the embrace of the one you love. True? Can I say that again? You throw, cast your embrace into the arms of the one that you love. Friends, the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. God's answer to fear is his love. And we must prioritize the love of God in our hearts above everything that suggests fear to us. There is no fear in love. Perfect love. Love that has been acted on in Christ. The love we saw in Christ. That love should help you live above the fear that is around you. Maybe by Sunday, we will take time to speak about sacrifice. Why would Job be doing sacrifice? Or should I just give you two, three scriptures in that direction? Because we still have seven minutes and then on Sunday we will we on that. Is that okay? Is that okay? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10. Let's read. When people carry out sacrifices, has God ever demanded it? God has never demanded for sacrifice. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God. You people of Gomorrah, read with me. To what purpose is the multitude of sacrifices unto me? See the Lord, I am full of the bones of rings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bulls, bullocks or of the lamb or of the gods. When you come to appear before me, who had required these at your hand to tread my cause? All of those things you saw them do in the Old Testament. Majority of them came with their pagan background. They know to their Hallelujah. All right, to their pagan God, they do all those things. And when they came in contact with God, they felt, oh, what we are doing to our deity, we can bring it. God said, I was never interested. I've seen people say, oh, Solomon, kid, I made it. Mm, you must sacrifice. God does not need it. Eh? What did I say? Say it, let me hear. Was, they, was he ever a requirement? Let's read the next verse. Was he ever a requirement? Let's read the next verse. If you are there, we can read the next verse. One, two, go. Bring no more vain oblations. Insects is an abomination unto me. The new moon and Sabbath, the calling of assembly, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn. But men were still giving. And even today, there are preachers who will tell you, you need to sacrifice to the Lord. I never forget the young man came to me. He's a pastor brought by someone that I know. He said, the Lord is doing mighty things in your ministry. The Lord said to me, you need to make a sacrifice. And I smiled. Do you know why I smiled? Your revelation knowledge can never rise above the, what you know in the Bible. Even your vision cannot rise above what you know in the Bible. Did you hear what I just said? He said, your new moon and your appointed feast, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. But You know what I'm saying? But Job would say, let me offer. 
You didn't hear what I just said. Job will say, let me offer. But God says, no. Hebrews chapter 10. Let me do something there. Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> you see, that is the confusion of Job. I, I read from verse 1. Okay, verse 6. Let me just start from verse. Okay, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he see a sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body as thou prepared me. In bond offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. They were doing it. God said, I know they're interested. Had had no pleasure. <laughs> Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Let's do a little more because I can see you are getting, you are, you are getting involved. Jeremiah 7 from verse 21 to 28. I will stop in, on this sacrifice because Job felt he could use that to po, po, uh, postpone the evil day. Okay. From verse 21, I said, down to 28. From verse 21 to 28. Thus hear the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your bond offering on, onto your sacrifices and eat flesh. Next verse. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of East, East, the land of Egypt, consigning... When I brought them out, I never told them anything. But these things commanded I then. Say, obey my voice. And I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. But they hearken not, nor incline their ears. But they walk in the counsels, and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went back, and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day. I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophet, daily, rising early and sending them. Every day I'm sending them. Yet they hearken not unto me, nor incline their ear, but hardened their necks. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore, thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not. You know what they like? Sacrifice. But Samuel said to Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hacking than the fat of rams. God said, do this. He said, no. This year I will give him one cow. Let's go eat cow. One day he said, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. Psalm 50. Let's do that. Psalm 50. If I were hungry, I won't tell you. From verse 5, if you, or 6, from verse 6. Gather my saints from verse 6. Verse 6. Uh, he said, And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah, quickly. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee, I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for. All thy born to have been continually before me. Next verse. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goat out of thy food. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Come on. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the feed are mine. Next verse. If I were hungry, I will not tell thee. For the world is mine. And the fullness thereof. Who is in church tonight? Micah 6, 6 to 8. Micah 6, 6 to 8. Did you learn anything tonight? Casting all your cares. He cares for you. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves of a year old? How will I appear before God? 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Those of you that are drinking oil. Say it's the oil of God. This is why I say ten thousand rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Next now. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love mercy. And to walk humbly with thy God. He does not require all those big, big things. When men don't want to heed his voice, they look for something and call it sacrifice. Can I say that again? When men don't want to heed his voice, they look for something and call it sacrifice. To ameliorate, if you please, to appease. But he is not a deity that will be that can be appeased with those things. You can do that to your Shango and to the Ogun. But our God delights in mercy. I close with this last scripture. I don't even know. Should I read Psalm 46, 40 verse 6? Psalm 40 verse 6 and Amos 5 21. Psalm 40 verse 6 and Amos. Okay, I quoted one. Okay, good. Join me read. Want to go? Okay, sorry. I'll wait for you. I'm true. My time is up. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears has thou open. Bond offering and sin offering has thou not required. So why were they bringing it? Say bring it. One dangerous one. God has never been involved. And the last one I said was Amos 5.21. And we'll draw the curtain for tonight. Just to remind you. I hate. I despise your feast day. And I will not smell. In your solemn assembly. Next. Though you offer me burnt offerings. And your meat offering. I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offering. Of your fat beast. Next, take thou away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your vows. You see, men, but let judgment run down as water, that is just uh, mercy, and righteousness as mighty strength. Men like taking, they, they like a detour from the written. Friends, casting all your cares upon him, for he cared for you. Job was afraid. Job was making sacrifices. And God was never interested in those sacrifices. And because of all that. He gave an invitation to the devil. He invited the devil. And the devil took the center stage. But with our God is plenty mercy. And we can see. The mercy. The compassion and the pity of our God. In the life of Job. You may have also strayed. You may have said pastor. Yes I made a mistake. But I want us to count on one thing. That our God is full of compassion and of pity. And he knows how to bring us out of every challenge. Whatever it is today that is not of God. The compassion of God, the pity of God comes upon you. And your testimony comes out now. In the name of Jesus. I speak the peace of God over your heart. Every trouble today, I ask, let there be calm. In the name of Jesus. Whatever troubles your heart. The agitation of your heart. And I ask today. Let the comforting power of the Holy Spirit. Brood over your heart. And restore calmness to you right now. In the name of Jesus. You are healed in your body. I say you are healed in your body. Doors open voluntarily for you. And I speak that the redeemer of the Lord. Will return with everlasting song. In their lips. Thank you father. In Jesus name we pray.